We'll be learning about the diseases of the nasopharynx, right? So let's start off with the disease that is the Thornwall's disease. Okay, so it's nothing but an abscess or cyst formation in the nasopharyngeal bursa due to blockage. Okay, see so you can see over here the cyst that is forming in the nasopharyngeal bursa due to blockage. So whenever I say blockage, obviously the patient is going to present with bilateral nasal obstruction. So the presenting complaint is bilateral nasal obstruction and the treatment will obviously be incision and drainage. And the incision, please make a note, it's a very important question, will be a cruciate incision. Okay, so Thornwall's disease is an abscess in the nasopharyngeal bursa due to blockage. The patient presents with nasal obstruction, which is bilateral and the treatment will be incision and drainage. Right now, let's proceed to the very important topic that is the adenoids. Okay, so adenoids the condition is usually known as chronic adenoid hypertrophy or chronic adenoiditis okay now before we go into what is this chronic adenoiditis let's understand the normal physiological growth pattern of these adenoids right we know that adenoids are nothing but collection of lymphatic tissue right we are familiar with this basic concept okay so the growth starts at the age of around three to five years and these adenoids they reach their maximum size by five to seven years okay and after the seven years the growth in the size decreases okay so the maximum size is attained by the age of five to seven years so what happens when there is a pathology with these adenoids so the patient is going to present with bilateral nasal obstruction resulting in mouth breathing see you can see over here this is a patient with adenoiditis presenting with bilateral nasal obstruction and his mouth is open over here indicating mouth breathing and which results in a high arched palate okay and typically you can note the patient has elongated faces pinched nose and overcrowding of the anterior teeth very very important concept for the exam the adenoid faces what you're noting over here this can be an ibq also that's an image based question. So the elongated face, pinched nose, overcrowding of the anterior teeth, all of these indicate an adenoid facies. Please remember these features. Okay. So whenever it is combined with bilateral serous otitis media, there is bilateral conductive hearing loss as well. And also these children have a recurrent upper respiratory tract infections. Okay. And the most important condition is obstructive sleep apnea that presents due to an immense hypertrophy of the adenoids okay so it can be associated with pulmonary hypertension right ventricular hypertrophy and obviously core pulmonary okay now what will be the indication of adenoidectomy there's nothing but the management of these adenoids all of these above these are grave conditions right so these are the indications that is obstructive sleep apnea associated with pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular hypertrophy and core pulmonial. All of these will push you to do an adenoidectomy. Okay. Now let's look at the x-ray of how the soft tissues of a neck appear in a normal x-ray. Okay. So this is the hyoid bone. This is the pre-epiglottis fat. This is the thyroid cartilage. And here you have the free edge of the epiglottis which you can notice right this is the posterior wall of the hypopharynx so here is the free edge of epiglottis this is the posterior wall of the hypopharynx and here is the fixed portion of the epiglottis anteriorly there is the hyoid bone the pre-epiglottis fat and also the thyroid cartilage okay now Let's look at how you see an x-ray in adenoid hypertrophy. The most important sign is the crescent sign or the dodge sign. That's nothing but air in the posterior superior region to the mass. Okay. So here you can notice the black region that is indicating the air that is present posterior superior to the adenoid mass. Okay. Here are the hypertrophied adenoids that you can notice. Okay. So, the treatment will obviously be adenoidectomy. So, the important exam point over here is the crescent sign or the dodge sign. Okay. With that note, let's now proceed to the juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. Okay. 
Now, the most important point we have to remember over here is that it is the most common benign tumor of the nasopharynx. Please remember this important question. The most common benign tumor of the nasopharynx is JNA. Okay. And it is most commonly seen in young males. That is because it is an androgen dependent tumor. So, the common age of presentation is 8 to 22 years. Okay. Because it is an androgen dependent tumor. And where are its sites of origin? The sphenopalatine foramen, the vidian canal or the basis sphenoid. Okay. Here is the sphenopalatine foramen which is the most common site of this JNA. Okay. Sphenopalatine foramen connects the nasal cavity with the pterygopalatine fossa. Please make a note of this important point. Sphenopalatine foramen connects the nasal cavity with pterygopalatine fossa okay so inside the pterygopalatine fossa or the sphenopalatine fossa there is the most important structure that is our pterygopalatine ganglion okay so what about this pterygopalatine ganglion it is the largest peripheral parasympathetic ganglion very 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 important point okay so we have the pterygomaxillary tunnel that opens via the pterygopalatine fossa into the pterygomaxillary fissure and this further opens into the infratemporal fossa and the nasal cavity via the sphenopalatine foramen is connected to the pterygopalatine fossa we have just noted that okay now jna is a vascular tumor okay so the most common blood supply of juvenile angiofibroma of the nasopharynx is the sphenopalatine artery which is a branch of the internal maxillary artery okay it is exclusively seen in adolescent males because yes it is an androgen dependent tumor okay so what are the symptoms with which our patient comes to us when he has a jna so because there is no tunica media to this vessel there is profuse recurrent epistaxis which translates into anemia Okay, so the most important symptom the patient presents is recurrent profuse epistaxis and also symptoms of anemia along with nasal obstruction and a swelling in the cheek. Okay, on examination there is a reddish polypoid mass which bleeds on touch. Along with that when you look at the eye there is proptosis that is anterior bulging of the eyeball and telecanthus that is nothing but increase in the intercanthal length because the eyeball is pushed laterally okay so if these are the two canthi right so the length between these two canthi is increased because the eyeball is pushed laterally because of this growing mass in the nose of the patient so the presenting symptoms will be profuse recurrent epistaxis nasal obstruction swelling in the cheek and on examination, you will have a reddish polypoidal mass which bleeds on touch and proptosis along with telecanthus. Okay. So, this results in what is known as the frog face deformity. Okay. So, the typical most important question for you is the frog face deformity. So, how will we confirm the diagnosis? It will be with a CECT. That is a contrast enhanced CT. Right. So, the first sign we have to remember is the Hormon Miller sign and the second sign is the Honduza sign. Okay. Hormon Miller sign is nothing but anterior bowing of the posterior maxillary wall. See, this is the normal structure of the maxillary wall and this is the wall that is bowing anteriorly. Okay. This is the anterior bowing of the posterior maxillary wall. This is known as the antral or the Hormon Miller sign. Right. The next one is the Hondosa sign. That's nothing but the widening of the pterygomaxillary tunnel. As you can note, there is a widening of this tunnel. That's nothing but the pterygomaxillary tunnel, which is much thinner over here. Okay. And there is a hyperdense spindle shaped tumor, which typically has a dumbbell shape. You can note over here, somewhat has a dumbbell shape. And obviously, tissue is the gold standard. So, biopsy will be the choice of investigation to confirm the diagnosis okay now let's look at the treatment for this juvenile angiofibroma it is endoscopic excision okay so the treatment of choice is endoscopic excision and the surgical techniques which are commonly used we just have to remember the names 
the lateral rhinotomy approach there is a wide exposure which get to excise the tumor but the problem is that it results in the formation of a scar okay the second approach that we are looking at is the transpalatine approach the limitation is that we have a limited exposure over here because the teeth are present in between so this gives a limited exposure to the tumor that is the backdrop of the transpalatine approach and the sardanus approach that is the transpalatine along with sublabial approach okay that is sardanus approach we just have to remember the names okay the mid facial degloving approach has a better exposure however and the endoscopic excision which is the preferred method of treatment of choice now is the best method because you have a good view of the tumor as well as the blood loss is very minimal because it is an endoscopic approach all right now with that note let's now proceed to the nasopharyngeal carcinoma okay now it again presents in males between the ages there are two peaks for its presentation between the age of 8 to 12 years or between the age of 60 to 70 years it is commonly seen in chinese due to the consumption of dry salted fish okay so the most common association for this is the association with Epstein-Barr virus, okay. Now there are a few other conditions which are implicated with the Epstein-Barr virus. These are the Hodgkin's lymphoma, the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, gastric adenocarcinoma and of course our nasopharyngeal carcinoma along with immune deficiency associated non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. All of these can be your questions, right. So these are the associations of the Epstein-Barr virus, okay. Now let's look at the where is the most common site of the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It is the fossa of Rosenmuller. Okay? And the most common type is of course the squamous cell carcinoma. That is more than 85% of the nasopharyngeal carcinomas are of squamous cell type. And the most common presentation is as a neck mass obviously. That is easy to understand. And 75% of them produce cervical lymph node metastasis that is why they present as a neck mass okay so there are two malignancies where lymph node metastasis is early but the prognosis is good usually we think that the prognosis is bad whenever there is lymph node metastasis but there are two exceptions for this these are our nasopharyngeal carcinoma and also thyroid carcinoma okay now there is also unilateral serous otitis media resulting in unilateral conductive hearing loss and whenever there is multiple cranial nerve palsy the first cranial nerve to be involved in this condition is the sixth nerve that is the abducent nerve right so the olfactory nerve is spared although it is a nasopharyngeal carcinoma the first nerve to be involved is the sixth nerve which supplies the lateral rectus of the eyeball okay now what is the trotter's triad? It's a very, very important exam question over here. So the triad includes number one, ipsilateral trigeminal neuralgia. That is due to involvement of the fifth cranial nerve. Ipsilateral palatal palsy. That is due to the involvement of 10th cranial nerve and unilateral serous otitis media. So our triad includes trigeminal nerve neuralgia. That is due to fifth cranial nerve. Palatal palsy. Both are ipsilateral right that is due to 10th cranial nerve and unilateral serous otitis media this together is known as our sinus of morgagni syndrome and these are the trotter's triad please remember very very important example now we have to understand the tnm staging as well so t1 the tumor is limited to the soft tissues of the nasopharynx t2 uh, as you can see in this image, it is going to the nasal cavity or the oropharynx. The blue mass over here is your tumor. So in stage 1, it is limited to soft tissues of the nasopharynx. Stage 2, it goes into the nasal cavity or oropharynx. And stage 3, as you can see, it is going into the paranasal sinuses. Then stage 4, it is going upwards into the cranial cavity or hypopharynx and starts involving the cranial nerves. The first to be involved is our sixth cranial nerve okay so t1 there is a limited growth of the tumor t3 you can see it is going into the sinuses t4 invasive into the hypopharynx as well as the cranial cavity and also includes the cranial nerves okay now let's look at the m m means m0 this is m0 so there is no distant metastasis and m1 indicates 
obviously distant metastasis now the most important one this is common for all head and neck malignancy so let's try to memorize n1 is ipsilateral single growth which is less than 3 centimeters in size n2 3 to 6 centimeters in size n2a the tumor is ipsilateral and single when you look at n2b it is ipsilateral still but there are multiple growths n2c it will be bilateral or contralateral growth n3 n3a include growth greater than 6 centimeters and n3b includes the involvement of the hose triangle or the supraclavicular fossa so this is the location of the hose triangle or the supraclavicular fossa okay so this is nothing but an indentation immediately above the clavicle this is the supraclavicular fossa or the hose triangle okay now let's look at how the carcinoma of nasopharynx spreads so this is an easy image for you via the foramen lacerum and foramen ovale it involves the third fourth fifth and sixth cranial nerves resulting in ophthalmic symptoms and facial pain via the eustachian tube it goes to present with serous otitis media it goes to the nose and orbit resulting in nasal obstruction epistaxis and proptosis and distant metastasis it mainly involves the lung liver and the bone and the cervical nodes most commonly involved are the upper jugular and the posterior triangle nodes okay so upper jugular and the posterior triangle nodes very very important and when it involves the retropharyngeal nodes it presents with neck pain and stiffness and where the pharyngeal space it goes to involve the 9th 10th 11th and 12th cranial nerves resulting in horner's syndrome that is nothing but a triad of ptosis meiosis and anhydrosis right and it also involves the pterygoid muscle so if you memorize just this image you can remember all the spread of carcinoma of the nasopharynx where the green area is the root of spread and the blue area we are talking about the clinical features of the where, uh, areas where it spreads to okay now let's proceed to the diagnosis and treatment obviously the gold standard for diagnosis is going to be your endoscopic biopsy and the treatment of choice here is radiotherapy however we give chemotherapy in advanced cases okay so the prognostic markers will be First, we have to assess the Epstein-Barr virus. So, for that, we do two tests. That is the VCA viral capsid antigen and the early antigen. And for IgA, we test for IgA to the viral capsid antigen. This is 97% specific and 95% sensitive. So, we are using it as a screening test. Okay. Now, IgA to the early antigen is 99% specific and 90% sensitive. These are important questions. So, please memorize these statistics. Okay. So, the treatment of choice is radiotherapy and we do chemotherapy 